Hello there and welcome back to the final lecture on the topic of thermal processes in the lithosphere for the geodynamics course. In this lecture we're going to talk about the thermal structure of active tectonic areas and so this will be something of a synthesis of our discussion about heat conduction and heat production as well as time dependence and heat advection. So basically all of the video lectures in set 7 and 8 will be summed up here. And we're going to look at basically two different examples, um, tectonically active mountain systems or active origins, and then we'll look at the case of the thermal structure in subduction zones. Now, as we've already seen, um, we basically have all the pieces now to look at the rather complicated thermal structure in these two settings. And uh, this is basically just a nice photo of the mountainous topography of the Teton Range in the western United States. Okay, so in our previous lecture uh, set about heat conduction, we looked at the example of the effects of mountain topography on temperatures in the crust. And so what we saw is that if we have some um, topography here represented by a sine wave that's going up and down like this, we see that the temperatures in the valley are relatively cool because we have a point that's at the surface compared to the same elevation if you were to go beneath a mountain peak where it's relatively warm. The other thing that you can see here based on this concept is that the temperature gradient beneath the valley would actually be a little bit higher than the temperature gradient beneath the valley. If you think about it here, the depth to which you encounter the 100 degrees C isotherm is shallower relative to the surface under a valley compared to a summit. And the picture we're looking at here then is the influence of topography in the absence of erosion. So there's no advection here and uh, you can see a little bit of bending of the 50 degree C isotherm and the 100 degree C isotherm is almost flat. Now things change obviously when you include advection. So what's shown over here in panel C is an advection velocity of one kilometer per million years or one millimeter per year. And now you can see the position of the 50 degrees C and 100 degrees C isotherms are much shallower in the crust and their general shape is much more like that of the overlying topography. Okay, and um, you know, we can see uh, this is quite a significant effect. The 100 degrees C isotherm is now at a depth range of around three to four kilometers where it was previously at 10 kilometers depth. So the crust is obviously much hotter in this case. Panel D shows the time evolution of the 100 degrees C Isotherm. So here at time 0 ma, that's the 100 degree C isotherm um, in panel B. At infinite time, or after an infinite time has passed with the advection of 1 kilometer per million years, that would be the 100 degree C isotherm as shown in panel C. And then we have different times in between there, 2, 4, and 6 million years are um, showing the time evolution of the position of the 100 degree C isotherm. Um, over um, this six million years that's considered here. So this is something we've looked at already in the previous lecture where we saw um, the effects of periodic topography, but we're now considering also the transient uh, component to that, the time dependent component. So when we start looking at more natural examples, things obviously get a little bit more complicated. Here we've got a figure of a, an active mountain range it's undergoing extension and so we have a normal fault that's shown here we have a sedimentary basin out in front of the mountain range where we have sedimentation and compaction taking place and so temperatures here would be relatively cool and then we have the foot wall of this normal fault where there's uplift of material toward the surface and where it's being eroded and so temperatures are relatively warm so when you go across the fault you essentially have the interface between this relatively cool basin and relatively warm um, uplifted mountain range and so then your isotherms as you can see here with the 45 degree C isotherm are bent then as you go across the fault. So that's an example of the picture for an extensional 
mountain range. Here's the case of the same thing in a contractional setting or a convergent um, setting. Here we have a thrust fault now, shallow angle thrust fault, thrusting material out over the top of a sedimentary basin. And so again, the basin here we have relatively cool material that's being deposited and, uh, and, and supplied uh, as a result of erosion of the mountain range. Over here we have uplift of relatively warm material toward the surface and erosion. The combination of those two is making this relatively warm, of course, and then again, as you go across the fault, uh, you have to have the interface between the cool and warm material on either side of the fault. And so in this case, uh, you know, when you go to sort of mid-crustal um, depth or a little bit deeper, you can actually see isotherms that will begin to fold over on themselves as you have really warm uh, hanging wall compared to a relatively cool um, foot wall. And so here's where I could show an example of some of the research I did, um, I guess, a few years back now. This is an example of a 3D thermal model uh, that was used to calculate temperatures in the crust, so going down to about 50 kilometers depth. Here we have two thrust faults. Um, in this particular setting, this is the, um, the central part of the Himalaya. So there's one thrust fault that's active here called the MCT, and then another, uh, the MFT, that is the main um, active thrust today. And so the combination of these two faults is uplifting material and advecting heat upward in the hanging wall. And then we have uh, essentially subduction of India um, that's taking place in the foot wall here. And so we have relatively cold material that's being pushed down. And what I want to draw your attention to is how these isotherms are folded as a result of um, heat advection. And so, you know, when the advection velocities are fast enough, you can end up with rather complicated um, thermal structures in these kind of active tectonic settings. Now, we can also look at the thermal field in subduction zones. And when we look at a subduction zone, there are a few different things that we want to consider. First off, they're going to have a highly deformed thermal structure. We have a subducting slab that's basically sinking down into the mantle. And this slab is relatively cold, of course. Uh, being that it was at the surface relatively recently and it's being pushed down and as it's being pushed down um, or sinking under its own weight it's dragging with it relatively cold temperatures to quite significant depth so you can see 600 and 800 degrees C depth um, uh, temperatures at depths of you know four or five hundred kilometers where the surrounding asthenosphere is at temperatures of you know almost um, almost a thousand degrees hotter. Now, when we look at this structure, there's a few places that are uh, useful to consider. First off is the fore arc, which is the part of the subduction zone that's on the ocean side of the arc volcanoes. The back arc then would be on the, um, the continental side. And then further inboard, we'd have the continental cratonic region. That picture gets a little bit more clear when we look at a real example here. And so this is the um, some data from the Cascadia subduction zone. So this is in the western part of the United States and Canada, western North America. So this is Vancouver Island, if that means anything. Um, then Seattle would be somewhere down here. And in this cross section A, B, there's a whole bunch of different heat flow measurement data that are all projected onto um, a cross section that's going kind of perpendicular to the subduction zone. And so what you see is the fore arc is relatively cool. We're basically sitting on top of this downgoing plate, and so things are cold there. In the back arc, we have uh, the arc volcanoes, first off, uh, that are indicated here on the cross section, and then the back arc region where we have uh, relatively high temperatures as a result of induced uh, mantle flow. Once you cross out of the back arc region and go back into the continental craton, you can see again that the heat flow drops off. And so here we have a relatively cold fore arc, a warm back arc, and then a cold craton. And if you look at it in terms of the geotherms, you see the cratonic geotherm is relatively um, shallow, and the temperatures are increasing relatively little with depth compared to the back arc geotherm, where temperature increases are much higher. All right, so that's it for heat transfer. And now it's your chance to take the last quiz on this topic before moving on to the next lecture set where we'll start talking about fluid dynamics.